Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today on the podcast, we have Andrews and the Law Society of British Columbia. So this is another Section 15 decision under the charter. We have put up a lot of them. We had uh, Thomas guest read Rhiannon in Alberta, and we had Teddy guest read Eldridge. We're definitely a fan of Section 15 here. They tend to be very, you know, interesting, well-written decisions, albeit a little bit long. Uh, This one's probably going to go out in a couple of parts because there are three decisions. But essentially, it's uh, it's not the most recent law on Section 15, but it's definitely a seminal seminal decision in sort of the line of cases that lead us up to where we are now. So what do you know about Andrew, Zach? So my only issue with some of the Section 15s is I get them confused a little bit. But I remember that um, Andrew's deals with the analogous grounds within section 15. And that's kind of the big picture of Andrews and the inclusion of like what constitutes an analogous ground for the purposes of section 15. Yes, definitely. It is the decision that allows analogous grounds and they do go into sort of, you know, other uh, legislation that sort of would, that would suggest that most people don't know. And by most people, I mean, literally myself, that human rights legislation in the provinces predated the charter. So there was a lot of human rights legislation in Ontario, for example, before the charter was enacted in 1982. So the court gets into a lot of this previous language in in terms of like, what is a ground and how do we have different grounds and that sort of stuff. So it's definitely a good overview in terms of um, where they get the judicial history in terms of how we define Section 15. And uh, definitely same Z's on the uh, getting all the Section 15 cases confused. Spoiler alert for our listeners, this is the second time me and Zach have had to do Andrews in the Law Society of BC because I got it confused with Law in Canada last time, which is also a Section 15 case. And the introduction was no good because we were talking about a totally different case than poor Mr. Andrews and the citizenship requirement to be a lawyer in BC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's unfort it, not that it's unfortunate, but it's um, one of the benefits about doing the podcast is we have so many cases that we get to remember and talk about. And I'm I I imagine it can't just be us. I feel like it's just like a symptom of common law that like you read so many of the same kind of areas of laws they build, you kind of get the wires crossed, which is okay. It happens, and that's why we have the ability to re-record these things. <laughs> Exactly. And this one especially, I think my biggest confusion was, um, so in Andrews, Justice McLaughlin was actually the lower court judge. So they're reading substantial parts of her decision in the Supreme Court decision. And then by the time Law in Canada rolls around, she's actually in the court by then. So it's a sort of thing where I got my levels of court of Justice McLaughlin confused in my mind. And because the court so extensively quotes her, they, you know, they don't adopt all of her reasoning, but they adopt a lot of it, uh, the Supreme Court. And I sort of got my wires crossed in terms of the timeline of the decision because Justice McLaughlin does um, pen a lot of the later Section 15 decisions once she is finally on the court. Yeah. So it happens, but I do actually, now that we talk about it, it is the citizenship requirement to be a lawyer, which again is such an interesting thing to kind of wrap your head around, as well as thinking about like human rights legislation. I think one of the problems with discussing Section 15 is as students of law school, the charter is kind of like this moment in time. And we don't really learn too much pre-charter in terms of human rights, at least from the con law class that I took. I didn't take any human rights classes in law school, so there obviously will be exceptions to my carte blanche rule. But, (laughs) you know, I just think that maybe some of these discussions are just lost, probably not enough time. Yeah, and it's, you know, this one gets overlooked a lot. Like, we don't really read Andrews so outside of the context of like, yeah, they talk about analogous grounds and that's why it's important. But McLaughlin's decision, which they cite, has a lot of, you know, very strong language against having a citizenship requirement. And she's just like, look, you can be a Canadian and be anywhere and not be even remotely concerned with, like, the law in B.C., 
But if you're an immigrant who's chosen to come here, you are making a very conscious choice to be invested in Canadian society. And like that's not something that a natural born citizen is necessarily doing. So although, you know, although the case isn't really about immigration, it de facto sort of becomes about immigration because Justice McLaughlin makes some sort of very strong pro-immigration stances in terms of like this requirement doesn't do what you think that it does because of your sort of misunderstanding of the way that immigration works. The Supreme Court doesn't agree with her on all those points exactly, but uh, the language of Justice McLaughlin is definitely worth looking into. And with that, we hope you enjoy. Andrews is definitely sort of the first in the line of the Charter Section 15 cases because it was from 1986, I believe, so right before I was born. Uh, So this is a good one to start out with if you're looking into Section 15. So we hope you enjoy. Andrews and the Law Society of British Columbia On appeal from the Court of Appeal of British Columbia The judgment of Chief Justice Dixon and Justices Wilson and Luray DeBay was delivered by Justice Wilson. I have had the benefit of the reasons of my colleague, Justice McIntyre, and I am in complete agreement with him as to the way in which Section 15.1 of the Charter should be interpreted and applied. I also agree with my colleague as to the way in which Section 15.1 and Section 1 of the Charter interact. I differ from him, however, on the application of Section 1 to this particular case. As my colleague points out, Section 2 of the Barristers and Solicitors Act differentiates between citizens and non-citizens with respect to admission to the practice of law. The distinction denies admission to non-citizens who are in all other respects qualified. While the citizenship requirement applies only to those non-citizens who are permanent residents, it has the effect of requiring those permanent residents to wait for a minimum of three years from the date of establishing their permanent residence before they can be considered for admission to the bar. It imposes a burden in the form of some delay in obtaining admission on permanent residents who have acquired all or some of their legal training abroad. I agree with my colleague that the rule which bars an entire class of persons from certain forms of employment solely on the ground that they are not Canadian citizens violates the equality rights of that class. I agree with him also that it discriminates against them on the ground of their personal characteristics, i.e. their non-citizen status. I believe therefore that they are entitled to the protection of Section 15. Before turning to Section 1, I would like to add a brief comment to what my colleague has said concerning non-citizens permanently resident in Canada, forming the kind of discrete and insular minority to which the Supreme Court of the United States referred to in the United States and Caroline Products Company. Relative to citizens, non-citizens are a group lacking in political power and as such, vulnerable to having their interests overlooked and their rights to equal concern and respect violated. They are among those groups in society to whose needs and wishes elected officials have no apparent interest in attending. Non-citizens, to take only the most obvious example, do not have the right to vote. Their vulnerability to becoming a disadvantaged group in our society is captured by John Stuart Mill's observation in Book 3 of Considerations on Representative Government, that in the absence of its natural defenders, the interests of the excluded is always in danger of being overlooked. I would conclude, therefore, that non-citizens fall into an analogous category to those specifically enumerated in Section 15. I emphasize, moreover, that this is a determination which is not to be made only in the context of the law which is subject to challenge, but rather in the context of the place of the group in the entire social, political, and legal fabric of our society. While legislatures must inevitably draw distinctions among the governed, such distinctions should not bring about or reinforce the disadvantage of certain groups and individuals by denying them the rights freely accorded to others. I believe also that it is important to note that the range of discrete and insular minorities has changed and will continue to change with changing political and social circumstances. For example, Justice Stone, writing in 1938, was concerned with religious, national, and racial minorities. In enumerating the specific grounds in Section 15, the framers of the Charter embraced these concerns in 1982 
but also addressed themselves to the difficulties experienced by the disadvantaged on the grounds of ethnic origin, color, sex, age, and physical and mental disability. It can be anticipated that the discrete and insular minorities of tomorrow will include groups not recognized as such today. It is consistent with the constitutional status of Section 15 that it be interpreted with sufficient flexibility to ensure the unremitting protection of equality rights in the years to come. While I have emphasized that non-citizens are, in my view, an analogous group to those specifically enumerated in Section 15 and, as such, are entitled to the protection of the section, I agree with my colleague that it is not necessary in this case to determine what limit, if any, there is on the grounds covered by Section 15, and I do not do so. Section 1. Having found an infringement of Section 15 of the Charter, I turn now to the question whether the citizenship requirement for entry into the legal profession in British Columbia constitutes a reasonable limit which can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. As my colleague pointed out, the onus of justifying the infringement rests on those seeking to uphold the legislation, in this case the Attorney General of British Columbia and the Law Society of British Columbia, and the analysis to be conducted is that set forth by Chief Justice Dixon and the Queen and Oaks. The first hurdle to be crossed in order to override a right guaranteed in the Charter is that the objective sought to be achieved by the impugned law must relate to concerns which are pressing and substantial in a free and democratic society. This, in my view, remains an appropriate standard when it is recognized that not every distinction between individuals and groups will violate Section 15. If every distinction between individuals and groups gave rise to a violation of Section 15, then the standard might well be too stringent for application in all cases and might deny the community at large the benefits associated with sound and desirable social and economic legislation. This is not a concern, however, once the position that every distinction drawn by law constitutes discrimination is rejected, as indeed it is, given the judgment of my colleague Justice McIntyre. Given that Section 15 is designed to protect those groups who suffer social, political, and legal disadvantage in our society, the burden resting on governments to justify the type of discrimination against such groups is appropriately an onerous one. The second step in a Section 1 inquiry involves the application of a proportionality test, which requires the court to balance a number of factors. The court must consider the nature of the right, the extent of its infringement, and the degree to which the limitation furthers the attainment of the legislative goal reflected in the legislation. The Appellant Law Society submitted that the Court of Appeal erred in its consideration of the citizenship requirement by failing to accord the proper recognition to the role of the legal profession in the governmental process of the country and in failing to consider that Canadian citizenship could reasonably be regarded by the legislature as a requirement for the practice of law. The respondents, on the other hand, argued that the Court of Appeal was right in concluding that there was not a sufficiently rational connection between the required personal characteristic of citizenship and the governmental interest in ensuring that lawyers in British Columbia are familiar with Canadian institutions, are committed to Canadian society, and are capable of playing a role in our system of democratic government. I am in general agreement with the reasoning of the Court of Appeal on this aspect of the case for the following reasons. The trial judge in this case concluded that the discrimination against non-citizens in Section 42 of the Barristers and Solicitors Act was justified under Section 1 of the Charter. He said, quote, I find citizenship to be a personal characteristic which is relevant to the practice of law on account of the special commitment to the community which citizenship involves, and not merely because the practical familiarity with the country necessary for that occupation can generally be expected in the case of citizens." End quote. On appeal, appeal Justice McLaughlin, as she then was, found that the exclusion of non-citizens was not rationally connected to the governmental interest in ensuring that lawyers had a sufficient knowledge of local affairs and institutions for the competent practice of law. She stated, quote, citizenship does not ensure familiarity with Canadian institutions and customs. Only citizens who are not natural-born Canadians are required to have resided in Canada for a period of time. Natural-born Canadians may reside in whatever country they wish, 
and still retain their citizenship. In short, citizenship offers no assurance that a person is conscious of the fundamental traditions and rights of our society. The requirement of citizenship is not an effective means of ensuring that the persons admitted to the bar are familiar with this country's institutions and customs." End quote. I appreciate the desirability of lawyers being familiar with Canadian institutions and customs, but I agree with Appeal Justice McLaughlin that the requirement of citizenship is not carefully tailored to achieve that objective and may not even be rationally connected to it. Justice MacDonald pointed out in Reed Dickinson and Law Society of Alberta that such a requirement affords no assurance that citizens who want to become lawyers are sufficiently familiar with Canadian institutions, and it could be better achieved by an examination of the particular qualifications of the applicant, whether he is a Canadian citizen, a British subject, or something else. The second justification advanced by the appellants in support of the citizenship requirement is that citizenship evidences a real attachment to Canada. Once again, I find myself in agreement with the following observations by Appeal Justice McLaughlin. Quote, the second reason for the distinction, that citizenship implies a commitment to Canadian society, fares little better upon close examination. Only those citizens who are not natural-born Canadians can be said to have made a conscious choice to establish themselves here permanently and to opt for full participation in the Canadian social process, including the right to vote and run for public office. While no doubt most citizens, natural-born or otherwise, are committed to Canadian society, citizenship does not ensure that this is the case. Conversely, non-citizens may be deeply committed to our country." End quote. The third ground advanced to justify the requirement relates to the role lawyers are said to play in the governance of our country. Appeal Justice McLaughlin disputed the extent to which the practice of law involves the performance of a governmental function. She stated at paragraph 614, quote, While lawyers clearly play an important role in our society, it cannot be contended that the practice of law involves performing a state or government function. In this respect, the role of lawyers may be distinguished from that of legislators, judges, civil servants, and policemen. The practice of law is first and foremost a private profession. Some lawyers work in the courts, some do not. Those who work for the courts may represent the Crown or act against it. It is true that all lawyers are officers of the court. That term, in my mind, implies allegiance and certain responsibilities to the institution of the court but it does not mean that lawyers are part of the process of government." End quote. Although I am in general agreement with her characterization of the role of lawyers qua lawyers in our society, my problem with this basis of justification is more fundamental. To my mind, even if lawyers do perform a governmental function, I do not think the requirement that they be citizens provides any guarantee that they will honorably and conscientiously carry out their public duties. They will carry them out, I believe, because they are good lawyers, and not because they are Canadian citizens. In my view, the reasoning advanced in support of the citizenship requirement simply does not meet the test in Oaks for overriding a constitutional right, particularly, as in this case, a right designed to protect discrete and insular minorities in our society. I would respectfully concur in the view expressed by Appeal Justice McLaughlin that the citizenship requirement does not appear to relate closely to those ends, much less to have been carefully designed to achieve them with minimum impairment of individual rights. Disposition. I would dismiss the appeal with costs. I would answer the constitutional question as follows. 1. Does the Canadian citizenship requirement to be a lawyer in the province of BC as set out in Section 42 of the Barristers and Solicitors Act infringe or deny the rights guaranteed by Section 15 of the Charter? Yes. 2. If the Canadian citizenship requirement to be a lawyer in the province of BC as set out in Section 42 of the Barristers and Solicitors Act infringes or denies the rights guaranteed by 15.1 of the Charter, is it justified by Section 1 of the Charter? No. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Radamile. 
Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.